right, nice job. Good set. Let's do some social kick. All right. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me on the Social Kick podcast or Facebook Live, however you want to call it. I'm John Mullen, and I'm joined here with some of my good friends, as well as one special guest here today. So I have George Bravell with us as a special guest. He's a Olympian, uh, Olympic medalist, um, really an amazing swimmer with a lot of versatility underneath his belt. So he's going to be joining us here, but I also have a few of our regulars with us as well. Who's joining me today? Brian Lundquist. Luke Paddington. Justin Wayne. <laughs> They're very formal guys. I like it. No, no extra energy at all there. Yeah, I got a, a, a yes or too. Like, I feel like I missed out on that. <laughs> you know, part of the problem is that normally we're drinking a beer when this is going on, and uh, it's barely noon, so we're, we're barely past lunchtime. <laughs> Ryan, you're not drinking today? I thought you said you were potentially going to have a, a one o'clock beer. That's five o'clock somewhere. Maybe I should. <laughs> oh, there we go. Brian. All right, we'll see if your internet holds in there, Brian. You froze for a second. But nonetheless, uh, like I said, we have uh, Olympian George Bovell with us here. And we wanted to have George on for a while because, I don't know, Luke, do you want to give a little backstory about how you and George know each other? I know you've alluded it, alluded to it a few times before. George, that's a good question. How do we know each other? How do you yeah, we'll see where this goes. 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think George is like my little brother, I guess. I mean, we started swimming together back in the day in, in the 80s and, and, and in, in 90s in Trinidad, George. How, how do we know each other? And what's our relationship like, I guess? I knew you were like this big older guy who was really fast and um, you know, <laughs> away somewhere and you're like a legend who returned. Oh, that's Luke Paddington. <laughs> you could have the speedo bag, you had a kickboard, you had all this equipment. You know, it looked professional. Then Wait, George, he was a legend? <laughs> <laughs> The story is a legend. 1996, we went to the CISC in Puerto Rico. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to make Olympic Games back then. Yeah. Um, I was very impressed with like your, your swimming track suit, your kickboard, <laughs> your like, swimming bag. It's like, wow, that's how the big swimmers do it. Maybe I'll be like that one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hasn't changed. <laughs> It's funny, it's funny like that it's the, some of the things that you latch on to that you remember about people in certain ages, you know, like I can remember my first U.S. Nationals and when I saw Phelps for the first time swimming and was like ran into Cleek Keller and just some of these people that are names or what they were doing, what they were wearing. So, Do you remember, uh, well, Chris Babylon had a big beard. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, that neat. I remember George was this really wild little kid who was annoying us. I'm trying to focus on my meat, and George almost lit a room on fire or something. Like, I remember you got some mischief because we were staying in the dorms. You, you were full of energy. You were a 13 year old boy. How old were you in 96? You were 13 or 12, right? You were yeah, full yeah, of energy. In 11, 12, yeah. Yeah. And we were on the national team, wasn't it? The floor of this high rise, it had no elevator. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then what, what we continued, our past continued, well, you started ramping up your swimming. Um, leading up to Sydney, you started in, um, you, would, you had family in Montreal, and you'd come up to Montreal where I was swimming at McGill, and you would train with us once in a while, and you start, that's where you started your relationship with Camo and, and the team out there in the Pitting Olympic. So you'd stay by us, you'd stay by your cousins, and I got to know you, um, you know, as a swimmer there, you and your brother Nicholas. Um, so much so that my brother Sebastian and, and you started training together closely at Bulls School when you moved to Bulls, and you guys um, qualified for Olympic Games and then um, trained together for a few months in Jacksonville with swimmers like Damien Allain and, and Janelle Atkinson and these people. And then you guys went off to the Olympics, and I got to watch you swim your first race ever at the Olympics, and I got to watch your last race at the Olympics, which was a pretty nice um, circle. I mean, how many Olympics did you go to, George? Five. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so Luke is um, omitting a very important part of the story. So I, I really owe the second um, successful part of my swimming career to Luke. You know, I was coming back from a brain injury that had me bedridden for almost six weeks. I got very skinny and weak. And the hardest, hardest part of, the, of any endeavor is the beginning, you know, just getting that momentum going. And everything is so much harder because you're so out of shape and you're so physically weak. And um, 
we started to do ocean swims together. Now we would do these long, maybe three, four, five K continuous swim, freestyle backstroke out in the ocean in Trinidad. And that kind of stuff, um, I don't think I would have gone and, and really pushed that as hard if I was by myself. And I think Luke really just, he brought in a whole bunch of energy. And while Luke, you never went, I know you, you never went to the Olympics, but uh, you know, uh, it must feel good. I hope you feel good and understand that uh, I went to the Olympics that, uh, that time in London and Rio, even my career continuing because of how you helped me get going again. And we were running in the mountains, in the hills. Yeah, we were trained really, really hard for how long was that? Maybe yeah. weeks or two months. Yeah, and then and then you came over to the Bay Area and you stayed here mm -hmm. for a couple of months training as well when you were training at Cal with Mike. And um, yeah, yeah we had a really yeah. good session here as well. And and you started when did you when did you get your bronze? What year did you get your bronze in, in Wills? In the 50th oh, frame? 2013, yeah. Right, so it was yeah. afterwards, right? Luke helped me get going from zero, from nothing, from a skinny, half dead corpse, <laughs> back to make the Olympic final, and then the following year to get the World Championship bronze in the 53, which was totally different, different event from my previous uh, 200 yeah. style and 200 hour one. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Luke. I'm forever grateful, and um, I hope you hope you understand that you had a big, big part of that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you, You're my little brother, man. All good. Yeah. Excellent. George, so, are, you the only person, are you the only person to make the transition from 200 IM to 53? Yeah, I don't metal? Think anyone's ever done it before. Mm -hmm. It's like two opposite races completely. Yeah, George, um, Luke was telling me the other day, you used to do like 400 IM sort of in the distance range. And for me growing up, when I would watch your races between my high school days, I would just see you doing all the sprints. So it's kind of interesting to see you do all the IMs and sort of this or hear that you did the IM and some of the distance events. But so yeah, it was crazy transition. And growing up, we didn't really have any, uh, you know, in, in a bigger country, people tend to specialize earlier because that's where they make the finals. But coming from a very uh, small country with a small um, pool of swimmers, literally, um, everybody swims every event at every meet. So growing all the way up until college, I would swim every race at every meet I went to. Uh, mm -hmm. From the 1500 to the 50. Oh my God. <laughs> Age group coaches are just like cheering right now. They're like, yes, we know. We know. We know the records as well. At Bulls, we actually had a special test set that they would keep the, the times from guys like Greg Burgess who were doing them. And it was the set was the national order of events. And uh, it was for time. You just swim all the events back to back to back to back. And when you finished, how long did it take? George, you'll be proud of me. I've done the Burgess set once. Once in my life, no, didn't barely survive. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> George, what's the hardest race in swimming? I would say the hardest race is probably the 200 IM, because you're you're sprinting every single stroke, and now if you're doing it right, by the time you've reached the end of the breaststroke, you're you're you're, you're in trouble. Like. Uh, you have nothing left, and you have to somehow. How did you feel? Um, in, in you that Olympic final, when you went from seventh to second in that fifth breast, how did you feel that last fifth day after that? You went to second place. It, when you swim it right, there's nothing left by the time you're pushing off on freestyle. It's just adrenaline, and it's just a, a deep, deep desire from your soul, basically, to push your body to make it. And when we really think about swimming, yeah, growing up in the pool. Swimming is so normal for us, but for people who, who can't swim, who watch this, they're seeing men fight in an element that could kill them. If you get too tired in water, it's very giving. You're going to drown. So you have to go against your instincts to push yourself that far. And I think that um, the 200 IM is one of those races that, um, that you have to go to that place to be good. Another really hard race, probably the 200 backstroke. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Two hundred back long course is so difficult. So, George, I know we want to get into your reactions to what's going on in the in the sport today and with the Olympic Games. But I think perhaps maybe a good place to start is tell us about your Olympic experience. Um, perhaps, perhaps maybe start with that that Athens experience, or perhaps if you want to go back to Sydney, that's that's cool too. But 
Where, where, what is, where, tell us about your experience and what the Olympics means to you. Okay. Um, so Sydney was just over the top impressive for me. I was coming in very young, impressionable, um, seeing the likes of swimmers I'd idolized before, like Popov. Um, it was really just um, an incredible motivator for me when I came back. I was very inspired. And um, Athens, I came in with a lot of pressure. I was the, the world record holder in the short course 200 IM. I had been ranked number one in the world for a while before um, in 2003. And, um, and I had an injury. So it was very difficult and I put a lot of pressure on myself. And, um, and I look back with a lot of satisfaction about how I handled it and how I pulled it out. And um, I think that it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you, in that moment of weakness, you never give up, you push through it, then you're a champion. It doesn't that matter really what you're doing. That's the essence of what it means to be a champion. And then um, Beijing was very impressive, but I was uh, coming back from completely changing my events uh, after the Athens Olympics. In the 200 IM, I suffered a terrible knee injury that, that prevented me from doing breaststroke like I used to. So I realized that I was never going to be as good as I was at my best event. And I was faced with two options. Either, okay, that's as good as I could ever be. Let me retire. Or um, let me um, try to continue. And, and if I'm going to continue, I'm going to do it out of love and choose the race that I want to do. And I thought the 200 IM was always about who's the best all-round swimmer. But uh, there was one race that uh, really appealed to me, and that was the 50 freestyle. It's like, okay, who's the best swimmer is maybe the IM, but who's the fastest man? There's just something special about that. Who's the fastest in the water? And um, I wasn't very good at the 50 freestyle back then, and I changed everything. I went to a new coach and started working with Mike Bottom, who at the time I had had a lot of success. Two of his swimmers tied for gold in Sydney in the 50 free. Gary and Anthony Irvin. And then in Athens, two of his swimmers were separated by one or two one hundredth of a second in the 53, Gary and Dewey. So I figured that would be the best place to learn and to approach, approach it as a, something I need to take the time to learn. I'm going to suck for a while. I'm prepared to lose, and, but I'm going to learn from each, each effort, basically, and practice right up through competition. And then, I mean, um, Beijing was a big breakout for me. Uh, I made the semifinals. I was 11th in the 50 freestyle. Um, and um, I was very impressed with the Olympics there. Like that, for me, that's where the illusion was the most powerful, Beijing. Like when you see a country like China co-opt it and use it as a way to kind of push its soft power out into the world, you know there's a lot of intention behind it. And even the way they had guards all the way around the village, like podiums, 25 meters apart. It was over the, over the top. London seemed a little bit more sincere. The emphasis was away from the politics and the soft power, more into the essence of, of the sport. Sport was really celebrated there. I really enjoyed the London Olympics and um, it was very well done. But then, ah, uh, I was going to retire after the London Olympics. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. And um, a man gave me a flyer and invited me right after the finals of the 50 freestyle to come and compete in a race in his backyard in the Bay Area. So I figured I'd hold on for just uh, one more month and I'll go out there and I'll meet my friends, Luke, and I'll hang out and swim some one-on-one uh, -on -one duels in a 25-yard pool in the backyard. Then I'll retire. And then I was talking to Anthony Irvin and some other guys, and I got inspired to go to the World Cup. And then I continued to the World Cup, and it was like all that training I'd put in before the London Olympics really started to pay off. Best times, best times, best times. And I, I continued running, just racing and racing and racing. And that was like my training. And I had a really good year, and I ended up getting a World Championship medal. And the following year, I, I got a World Championship bronze medal in the 50 freestyle. In that they say is the fastest 50 freestyle field ever. Everybody had an, an Olympic medal. On the time I got the bronze medal and would have got the silver medal in the London final. So at that moment, I decided, okay, there's more gas in the tank. Let's hold out for the, the Rio Olympics. But uh, as uh, the Rio Olympics approached, 
I was invited to become a delegate for Trinidad for the Pan American Sports Organization. And I started to see how, the, you know, when you're an athlete, you're just so focused on what's actually happening. You don't you look at the organization of it. You don't understand how the media is involved or how much revenue these events generate. And I started to understand how, how it's run like um, a mafia. And the, the previous head of the Pan American Sports Organization, he was in charge for 40 years straight. And the new guy at the time, I don't know if he still is, was the head of FINA. And he changed the FINA constitution so he could be reelected after he had passed the age limits. And at that time, the McLaren report was coming out that was showing how uh, uh, it was just covered up. And there were swimmers that I was swimming against who had three disappeared positive tests. And the whole I idea of the, of the Olympics, something that I had, um, I admit that I bought into this illusion that it was this heroic legacy from ancient Greece. And uh, that's not what it was. It's, it's all about the media. It's a, it's a reality TV show, but I couldn't see that before. And I had to understand how these organizers basically run the sport for profit. It's not about the athletes. It's like gladiators. And they run it for profit. And they want to make it as sensational as possible. Because that attracts the most viewers, the most media attention. And the more media attention it attracts, the more they can sell the TV rights for. And um, in a sense, I see it now as um, the first reality TV show. And if it started up tomorrow was the first, next year was the first Olympics, we'd all recognize, oh, of course, it's a reality TV show. There's golf, there's surfing, there's all the stuff that people like to watch that entertains us. We wouldn't be able to, to see it for what it was, but it's because we've been born into it. And it's been already there that we think it's this great big thing. And then we have to also recognize how countries co-opt the Olympics and use it as a way to disseminate their soft power into the world. So like in Moscow Olympics, 1980, America boycotts. America can't have its audience see the Soviets as people just like us. And then the same thing happens in 1984, the Soviets boycott. We can't ha they can't have their audience seeing all the American propaganda. And really and truly, if we look at the Olympics down to the history of it, Kubertin, Baron Kubertin, started this, the modern Olympics, to sell news to newspapers, to capitalize on the growing jingoism. And jingoism is, means extreme patriotism that was like rising in Europe around the turn of the century. And the French media wanted to know if the French boxer beat the German boxer. And the Greek media wanted to know if the Greek wrestler beat the Turkish wrestler. I mean, it was straight up, it was brilliant. He created an event so he could sell news. And that's the essence of it. And it was unfortunately, um, that's what it is. But we get so blinded and we can't see it for what it is that we end up sacrificing so much as athletes. We sacrifice even our health with overtraining. Ah, and we sacrifice our family, our loved ones. And um, sometimes we need a reality check to say, okay, all right, what am I doing here? All right, I'm practicing swimming. Is the goal really the Olympics or is the goal to become the greatest version of myself possible? Now I can use this path of swimming as a path to self-mastery. And swimming is a very extreme, difficult thing. And it's going to test me and push me to my limits and force me to grow in all kinds of ways that I could never have imagined that I would have had to grow. And if you pursue it as a path to self-mastery, it doesn't matter if they cancel the Olympic Games. As long as you've been 100% committed and pushed yourself honestly, you have grown as a person. You become stronger. And everything gets easier when you get stronger. Life will bring you more challenges and you'll be better equipped to handle those challenges. And we understand how, we have to understand how it really works. A challenge comes with a moment of weakness and in that moment of weakness, you really are presented with the perfect excuse. It is perfect, you know, maybe it's an injury, maybe it's exhaustion, maybe it's you're tired, maybe whatever it is. And you have to have a strong enough mind to say, no, I'm not taking that perfect excuse, I'm pushing this time. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a great perspective there, just uh, with 
as, as your whole mindset, you know, evolved over your different Olympiads and things like that. And maybe to become the greatest version of yourself, to be able to perform your best in your sport, you need to manage your time. You might need to learn how to set goals. You might need to learn how to take care of your health. You might need to learn to speak to the media. You might need to learn how to market yourself to get some sponsorship revenue to continue your dream. You, it's, it's a path, really. But if we see it as only about the Olympics and the destination and I'm going to post my Olympic ring tattoo on social media when it's all done, like you're, you're lost in the, in the illusion and you will suffer terribly. But if you see it for what it is, then you can work and actively participate in this path to self-mastery consciously. George, I remember, um, I mean, I always saw you after many races. I saw many of your races and I'll come speak to you right afterwards. How did it go? And you'd be like, well, you know, I could have touched better or I could have done this better. And you're always really hard on yourself, always looking for perfection. So after the Rio games, I came right out after your heat swim. That was effectively the last race of your career, the heat swim, right? Mm -hmm. And you were standing up there, I remember clearly smiling, just that I'm really relaxed and smiling and so content. And that was the, 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 the only time I've seen peace after you've done a race, and it was one of your worst races. It's interesting, right? To be honest, uh, imagine you, you go to the Vatican Church, St. Peter's Basilica. I don't know if you've ever been. It's very impressive. You go inside there, and it's marble. There's gold. There's statues. There's masterpieces of art. And it's just awe-inspiring. All my previous Olympics were awe-inspiring. And I went to the Rio Olympics, and it was just very third world, very unfinished, very rushed. You could tell everything was just slapped together. And the food was even terrible in the cafeteria. The previous Olympics, you go there, there's a dining hall with any kind of food you want, 24 hours a day. Rio was terrible. And for me, that's where the illusion melted down. Like, imagine you go to the, the Vatican, you think, oh, my gosh, the Catholic Church is all powerful. God lives in this church. But imagine if I took you to some remote little town in the Yucatan and I showed you a little like stone and wood building and said, this is a Catholic church. You'd say, oh, well, it's not such a big deal. At that Olympics, like the, the reality of it started to hit me. And um, I was very relieved to be done. And to be honest, I started to see how corrupt it was and how the cheating, they don't want to catch the cheaters. They want to make the sport as sensational as possible. And I was very disappointed with the governing body of the sport. And I was relieved to be done. But that was an important part of my journey too. Like that one, that Olympics was I had to learn how to handle failure. I had to learn how to lose. Mm -hmm. Some of the previous ones uh, in my journey, you know, it's very hard to learn how to win and handle winning without letting your pride grow. And as soon as your pride grows, that's calling down your defeat really pride always comes before the fall and that one i had to learn how to lose how to handle um, the disappointment and i understood that was what the test was so george you you you've gone to five games uh, from age 16 to age 32 um from a 200 from a 400 and 200 im guy in sydney to a 53 guy in rio so different stages of your journey different ages different events different levels of success what if the Sydney games had been postponed by a year right after you had just qualified? How would you have felt? What's your mindset? What, you can, what advice could you give that 16 year old? And just go through that kind of like what's an overarching advice you can give all swimmers at all athletes, all ages, from the Brent Haydens who is making a comeback to the Cheryl mm -hmm. Tops and the Trinidad who was just qualified for first games. You know what? It's interesting, right? What's the overall advice you would give or perspective on that? Because you've seen it all. You know, um, I think this is a reality check for everybody who's, who's sacrificing and striving for the Olympics. Usually, the reality check, the reality doesn't hit them until after. After it's over, they're like, now what? That was it? And they usually fall into like what they call it, the post-Olympic slump or depression, where like their life has no meaning anymore. They're lost. Now, this is a blessing in a way that... Um, the reality is coming to visit us now. And if you fail to live with reality, reality will come to visit you and you will be not ready for it and you will suffer. So here's a wake up call for everybody to say, all right, this is sport. This is only sport. It's just a thing I'm doing. I'm not a swimmer. I'm a person who practices swimming. I enjoy 
moving my body through the water in a smooth way. I, it's the closest I can feel, closest I can get to feel like flying. It is not who I am and this whole idea of a swimmer. And a lot of these um, successful swimmers get caught up in these illusions where they think they're rock stars. They think that the world revolves around them and that swimming is the most important thing and people idolize them and their egos get fed and fed and they grow and they get, they get totally lost. And I think this is kind of a, a blessing in a way that this collective psychosis of the Olympic games gets put in a healthy context. And we can say, ah, yes, it's about sport. Life happens. I have relationships. I have other goals. I need to be healthy. And like health is real wealth. And there's so many people who over themselves, they destroy their bodies and they destroy their mental health. You know, Phelps is always a big advocate about the mental health because he's, he's been in that very dark place. And uh, I think it's healthy for us to put it in the, the correct perspective and say, all right, I'm a swimmer. I'm not a swimmer. Swimming is something I enjoy. I mean, do it to enhance my, my life. Let me do it so that I can grow as a person. Let me welcome these challenges that will force me to grow. That's good. That's good advice, man. Absolutely. It's, it, it's definitely something my, I myself up in my career I was guilty of. I was so afraid to have retired. And, and like, well, how, how am I different to you now? Why, I'm just one of the crowd and I don't want that. And I was so proud to be different to the crowd. And I was really in my maturity. And I learned a lot from that. Um, so, yeah, it's really good advice. And it's hard to handle or to realize when you're young in your career, for sure. But it will be easier to handle if it comes sooner rather than later when people end their careers which is the depression we all get from being on the front page of the paper, having a medal on your shoulders and then not being in the press three months later. And then what happens? Yeah. And you start then you have one bad race and then, yeah. yeah. George, if you were in this position at any point in your career and you had put in one year, a season, four years, if you're thinking that far out for the training for, for this summer, do you think that it'd be helpful as an athlete to do something to see what your body was capable of doing? Like, let's say that you're motivated by the pure aspects of training and getting the best out of yourself. Do you think that it's helpful to, for some people who are in shape to, to still find a pool and race, even if it's not competing at something to see how they've progressed or would you simply move on? Yes, I understand um, what you're saying, but it's hard to, to just find a meet that will give you the same amount of uh, emotional motivation. Mm -hmm. You're gonna go in a little flat and um, it's very unfortunate. I know a lot of people who take on debt, they borrow money, they sacrifice so much. And I'm very, very sorry for those people. It is, it is, it is a, a, a terrible thing, but um, it can be a very positive lesson for us as well and help prepare us to have a better life. And if we're approaching this as a path to self-mastery, we need to welcome all the challenges that will force us to grow. And uh, for some people, maybe it's just unsustainable for them to hold on for another year, to delay getting a real job, to, to borrow more money. And, um, in that context, I think that could even help to remove this collective psychosis of the Olympics. And maybe we can start to see it as, all right, I was a reality TV show contestant. I was an entertainer. I swam in a, in a pool so the TV cameras could see it and broadcast it. And, um, and maybe they can dig a little bit deeper to say, all right, are you pursuing this just to go to the Olympics or are you swimming? Because you love swimming. If you love swimming, don't stop. Go swim with a master's team, do ocean swims, whatever. Just do it because you love it. Get back to the pure reason of why did you do it when you started? You did it because maybe you loved swimming. Maybe you had a good friends, social kicking. <laughs> just, uh, just yesterday, I was talking with a group of maybe 30 uh, age groupers, age 13 to 15, and a couple of them asked me, hey, did you ever think about quitting? Um, what, 
what were your thoughts and how did you navigate that in your career? And my feedback to them was, yeah, that thought had crossed my mind. However, the important thing to always think about is, why are you doing it? And mm -hmm. for me, I always loved the pure aspects of swimming, which is why when I retired from swimming, I continued to swim. There's a lot of people who, when they retire, they want nothing to do with the sport, but I always loved the feel of the water, the way yeah. that my body felt afterwards. And so what I told these kids was, you know, you should be focusing in uh, your life, whether that's swimming or another sport or something you're passionate about, should always be doing something that you love. And, and if you don't love what you're doing, then do something else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Brian. And this might sound a little bit harsh, but it's really the truth if you think about it. So there's some people who don't do the sport of swimming for the love of swimming. They are doing the sport of swimming to win so that everybody can say, oh yeah, you're the best. But if we really look at that and put that in perspective, it is because those people deep down feel like such losers inside that they have to portray this image of excellence and success outside. They have to make everybody say, oh yeah, he's a champion. And they need that external they need that externally because they feel like such losers inside. Now, if you feel like a winner inside, if you are secure with yourself, you have nothing to prove to anybody. you got nothing to prove to yourself. You know you're good. You trust yourself. You know your limits. And you're secure. Then you can go into it and swim for the love of it. There's nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove to yourself, nothing to prove to anybody outside. It's really the people who feel like the biggest losers who have to win at all costs. Now, winning is nice. Definitely, if you're going to compete, do your best. Try to win, but don't be so hung up on the idea of winning. Do it for the pure reason of the love of it. And that's why the Olympics has so much pressure, because you've got one billion people watching you who don't know anything about swimming, and see so you come dead last, even though you did the best time set in your record and only would last from 0.1 of a second. And they consider you a loser. And that's why people feel so much pressure on the blocks. And it's a good story of you and Cody Miller uh, telling that same advice to him, right? On um, behind the blocks. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, 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 it's a very hard lesson to do at the biggest stage of the Olympics, not even the world championships, not even your national meets. Um, how, how can one get their mind ready for that? How can one um, train their soul for that? You know? Mm -hmm. I Don't think it, say comes it. Down, it comes down to like self-love, really. If you love yourself, you are secure with yourself. You have nothing to prove. You don't need to get that love from an audience. You don't need to win the medal so your dad can be proud of you. No, you're, you have enough already. You're good. You're there. Enjoy it. Enjoy it every day, whatever it is you're doing. You don't do it to prove anything to anybody. What did you enjoy most about swimming? I mean, you're four years removed from any competition. I don't know when last you swam in chlorine water, probably four years, um, but you still love swimming. What do you still love about swimming? What did you love back then? Because that ten that answer probably is a common place for all of us in this chat and not all of us viewing. What what do you what do you love about swimming? And yeah. hmm. Brian said he felt like flying. Yeah. I mean, not not yet flying, he loved moving through the water. What do you, what do you say? You know, um, What do I love about swimming? I would say that really good swimming is like a dance with this very powerful feminine entity called water. And when you're a good dancer, you're moving the water as much as the water is moving you. And if you try to fight the water, you'll tense up, you'll, you'll sink, you'll drown. But if you surrender to her, she'll support you and float you. And that's a beautiful metaphor for life. That's poetic. Mm. <laughs> Georgia wanted to ask you about um, in the line of thinking of winning at all costs. There's some some prominent uh, cases within the last 12 months, especially. It seems like doping in the sport of swimming has really um, come center stage. And something that you know you and I offline have talked about for years. And so I'm curious, what do you think? Um, should happen with athletes who are currently banned and would have missed the Olympic Games and may have their opportunity come next year? 
Hmm. Uh, firstly, I think I was naive for, for a long time. I just, I could never imagine that people would think along the lines of doping because I, I wasn't thinking that way. I was projecting my own perspective onto everybody. But unfortunately, there are people who are doing it just to win. They're not doing it because they love swimming. And some of these people, you see them retire right after they've attained their Olympic gold medal. Um, now, that is a very good question, Brian. Like, should, should they be allowed to compete? I don't know if it's really um, my position to say whether they should or shouldn't. I think the public shaming is punishment enough almost. And um, yeah, that's how they're gonna get second chances as if the Olympics um, was never postponed. But um, I don't know, that's a good question. That's a big quandary, quandrum. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Brian and I were talking about that a little bit, that it's, yeah, uh, I don't know whose place it is to determine what the suspension should should do or what should be upheld. But um, obviously, like you said, with the public's view, even if you come up later and prove that supplements were tainted or things like that, you still have that reputation. It tends to follow you no matter what what happens just with the public shaming or just social media world that we are in now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's also, it blows my mind how naive we were when, like take for example, Brazil. I was at the Pan Am Games in um, 2007 and there was this Brazilian woman, Rebecca Guzmão, and she was so buff and strong and huge. It was like a physique I'd never seen on a female before. It was unbelievable. Now. I remember my dad and I having a talk after this meet just about how disappointed we were when we realized that it was the team doctor, the team medical official was accompanying her into the doping room and was urinating in her place. Wow. The sample that came from the team doctor, a female team doctor. Now, when you see that, yeah from the country that is spending all the money to host the, the 2007 Pan Am Games in anticipation of the Rio Olympics, you realize that it's this doping is not just uh, one swimmer and his little uh, internet Googling and he finds some substance and he starts to take it. No, this stuff is it's like state sanctioned. This is the entire federation behind that. And when you realize that these federations have the power to cover up things, I mean, of course, how much doping was really going on that has never been exposed. And it's very disheartening. And I think that when um, I, the Olympics is so far removed from its original intentions that now it's just about fame and money. It's no longer about who's the best or, or competing on an even playing field for honor. Like the Olympics, the Greeks used to say, sport is peacetime war. And instead of us going on the battlefield and, and killing each other, we want to know, does Sparta have the best warriors this year? Does Athens? Does, uh, I mean, so they would get together and they would have all these ways of competing, of testing the will, testing the, the desire for, for winning, the toughness, the fortitude, inner strength. They're tested in the water. It would be like a fight in the water, but indirectly. Tested on land. Who's the strongest? Who can throw the javelin the furthest? And that's what it originally was about. Now it's all about um, which country has the best doctors. <laughs> You know, it's it's messed up. George, you and I talk offline, so I'm I know to this question. Go ahead, sorry. And then, of course, like we've seen the the Olympics basically sell out to NBC and change the times of the finals to put them at nine a.m. We've seen NBC buy the Olympics and put the finals so it's prime time for American TV and have swimmers competing as late as one fifteen a.m. It's just. It it's never been about the athletes anymore. It's all about the money. And so, I'm so, so very glad that they have now uh, put the athletes first. I was surprised. I didn't think they would. I thought it was all about the money. 
and you have you have a lot of friends who still compete you have a lot of friends who are going to compete in tokyo um do you watch swimming much do you would you have watched the olympics if so which one and did you watch the isl and what do you think about professional swimming of course i would have watched the olympics um but i would watch it in the context of what it is it's the reality tv show the isl i think is going to do great things for the sport um I think in general, FINA has done a terrible job of promoting the sport. Look at where the way track and field has promoted it. There's a, we, tennis. And swimmers now, hopefully, because of the ISL, will actually be able to make a decent livelihood out of swimming. I mean, we're giving up the best years of our lives where we could be advancing in, in the corporate world. We could be uh, pursuing more education, but we're giving all of that up and living uh, like gladiator slaves. And I'm very glad to see that coming along. And um, hopefully a swimmer will be able to make a career like a track athlete or a tennis player. Are you, what, do you, go ahead. What, do you, what do you think is missing from the ISL or what do you think the sport of swimming could do to um, make it more exciting, to create more opportunities for people to continue to do it and help it grow? Uh, right off the bat, one thing that comes to mind is, um, okay, when we watch tennis, everybody knows what um, Federer looks like, Djokovic. Like, we can see their faces, but in swimming, unfortunately, you have a cap on, you have uh, goggles on, you can't see your eyes, you're face down in, a, in water, churning and splashing away. We don't really see you as a person. We see you as, like, um, a swimming machine. And I think there needs to be a little bit more personality kind of like woven in there as well. Like who are they? What challenges are they facing? Let's get, um, let's get to know the characters so we can identify where their struggles. What are they going through? Are they hurt? Where are they from? Where did they start? And it's hard to balance that and still have a, an exciting show. You don't want to always deviate into these backstories. That's for the producers, I guess, to figure out. Our attention spans are so short now. Mm -hmm. that that's a, a, a delicate balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to see them as a people who are swimming instead of just swimmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was, I've been recently watched some of the 1984 Olympic coverage and in those times, uh, including up through 96, uh, let's say it was probably the last time I recall seeing this in depth of the coverage <laughs> broadcast doing these backstories of people and carrying school books in California, and this is what life looks like in their speedo, <laughs> and it's become less that way. Uh, yes. Also, too, what they used to have at the Olympics, if you look at the footage of even 96 Olympics, 88 Olympics, they would march the swimmers out, and they'd be on the deck behind the blocks for about 10 minutes in their track suits, stretching, playing with the goggles, sitting down, and we could see them, and the audience would see them as people. Oh, wow, like you're like, Gustavo Borges is really tall. Look at that guy. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, he looks really stoic and see, focused. You know, you'd see them as people, but now, unfortunately, because the commercials got worth so yeah. much money, it's just run on a TV schedule. March them in, lane one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ready, go. Like we, we don't see them as people. We don't have that moment to realize like, wow, like that's a, that's a person. Like she must have really worked really hard to get there. We just see them as swimmers, not people. They did speed up that, that intro quite a bit. Um, one of the things they also have changed over time is they used to get three false starts in swimming, similar to track. <laughs> And backstrokers, when they hopped in the water, they would dive in and go to 12 and a half yards and come back. So mm -hmm. it, it was uh, the, mm -hmm. I don't know, the whole the whole aura, the pace of play was was so much slower at the time. But the the false start thing I found so silly, and I'm so glad that it's gone. I think it's kind what of you, some guys would um, let's say one competitor had a really good start. Yeah, false start on purpose to kind of like ice him a little. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> what sorts of things do you think are uh what like where do you think uh the next innovation in swimming is coming or what are we doing now that's so silly that should stop and we should move on hmm. 
I think in general, I think we can be a lot more conscious about our health. Mm -hmm. Eating right, taking care of our organisms better. And uh, we can't expect to be our best unless we are our most healthy. And there's, uh, there's too much overtraining. I think a lot of the supplements that people take, it's just pure marketing, consumerism. It's not even that good for you. It probably stresses your kidneys out. And that balance between our work and rest. Um, and I think that, um, and the mental health aspect of it as well, keeping the swimming in the correct context of the big picture of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that can be a lot better. And I think that's even getting worse and worse and worse. So let's take the mental health aspect uh, a little bit further, just because I think that is an important one and one that is starting to get some recognition, but um, it still could use a little bit more. So as a... Uh, or go on. I'll tell you from my, my own experience. Um, yeah. I think that when you see amazing swims, like those world records, um, doesn't matter what the sport is, anytime you see that level of extreme excellence, you are looking at a crazy person. That person has made themselves crazy because you have to become crazy to go through all that suffering and extreme, extreme sacrifice that it takes to become that good. So first of all, we're looking at really great athletes, but we're looking at really crazy people. Let's get that, let's get that straight. 99% of them are crazy. They're so imbalanced. Now, to get really good at a sport like swimming. Swimming is hard. It's like about holding a rhythm, an unsustainable rhythm. And you're trying to hold this unsustainable rhythm longer than someone else can hold it. And if you were to try to keep holding it for too long, you'll drown. And you have to get very, very tough to be able to endure the pain that comes with holding this unsustainable rhythm. And in getting tough, you become very detached. You stop feeling. You don't allow yourself to feel the pain. And there's a part of you that does not want to do those things that cause you to suffer. And you have to get such a strong mind that you overpower that feeling of not wanting to do it. So you can will yourself to do all these extreme, crazy, difficult things. And then you're going down this road, you're making yourself tougher and harder. Now, when you become hard, you're hard on everybody else and you're hard on yourself. When you're hard on yourself, you make yourself suffer more, which makes you get even harder and you get more and more and more extreme. And you lose the ability to feel the pain. You turn off that part of you that really feels the pain so that you can endure, you can push through. Even if you're injured, you can grind. We've all been there. But you also turn off the part of your mind that judges the pain as uncomfortable as something that's not good that judges this as hey this is awful now when you turn off the part of you that feels the pain you're also turning off the part of you that feels the pleasure and when you turn off the part of you that judges if something is difficult painful awful arduous you're also turning off the part of your mind that celebrates when things are really good so you go through life living these shades of gray you're so detached. You're not feeling anything. You're not feeling the bad, but you're also not feeling the good. You're not judging the pain, but you're not celebrating the beauty. You're just like a robot man and you're all a robot woman. You're always in your mind. You're always in the plan. You're never actually in the direct experience. Now, this makes people very sick. And what tends to happen is you're not feeling alive. Maybe you feel alive for, for a brief moment when you've had some type of success but you're always just suffering. You're not feeling anything. So people who go down this road, when they get too extreme, they start to seek out things that make them feel alive, even if it's just for a fleeting moment. But a lot of those things that they seek out that make them feel alive are very bad. Uh, they could be, um, and they, these lead to addictions. That brief moment of feeling alive gives them some pleasure. They actually felt something, wow. Maybe it was alcohol, maybe it was drugs, maybe it was sex. And these people are drawn back to that over and over again because it makes them feel something. 
And it, that's a terrible way to be, you know, you're just, uh, you're not alive. And these things that are making you feel are killing you and destroying you. So I think that's a side of the mental health that we need to keep in perspective. And we have to understand that those people who can endure and who can sacrifice like that, they're like all blade all the time with no handle. And you need to be balanced, you know, you need to be feeling and thinking. You need to be thinking about the plan, but you also need to be feeling. And you need to be communicating with your body, with your organism. In the same way your organism tells you like, oh, I'm thirsty. Oh, I'm, I'm hungry. And maybe you need the intellect to say, am I really hungry or am I bored? You need to tune into your organism and say like, what am I feeling? Am I killing myself? Am I burning the candle on both ends here for some illusionary goal of the Olympics that everyone will forget about 10 years from now? Like you need to keep it in perspective and use it to have a healthy life, a balanced life where you can grow as a person and not become a sick, crazy person who's going to... And it's all right. On another way of explaining it is if you get too hard, right? Like a tree that's refusing to bend in the wind. It's hard. Eventually, the wind will snap the tree. And a lot of these people who get too extreme, be it in tennis, track and field, swimming, eventually they, they break. And it's not nice. It's not a nice sight. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way to, to put it. And like you were saying, just this, this perspective and how it's evolved over time for you is huge and one that a lot of swimmers need to help realize and, and need help to figure this out. And we did have one comment or question for you from the audience from earlier. It was Junior Bernard was asking, you know, have you thought about returning to Trinidad to help develop their swim programs with all the knowledge that you've, you know, gained over time? Uh, let me read this question. Yeah. I mean, Junior Bernard, uh, thanks for your question. I mean, um, the idea is a good idea, but in reality, um, I, I got to make a living. I need to make a life. And um, I have to do things that are sustainable and in my own best interest, too. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Um, and, and one that, like you said, everyone needs to do. What, what journey it takes them on and, and follow their own path here. And obviously we all want to do millions of things, but mm -hmm. there's only so much time and energy and taking care of oneself. Like you were just talking about with one's own mental health is one that it's easy for us to kind of throw to the wayside or, you know, to disregard when that's, you know, arguably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So here's something, a way to, to think properly. So the mind is going to bring up all these desires, right? We have to use the intellect and let's walk the mind through that desire. Let's say we get that outcome. Let's say, all right, I sacrifice and I take out $60,000 in debt. So I have $120,000 in debt to continue for my Olympic dream. And I make the Olympics. I make the relay. Let me take, have my intellect, take my mind and walk down that road. So we get beyond the passions and we start to think rationally. And I say, okay, well now I have finished the Olympics. There are many people who go to the Olympics, but now I'm a person who's been to the Olympics with $120,000 in debt. And now I don't know what to do with my life. And you can say, all right, well maybe the mind might start to recognize, maybe that's not such a good idea. And as the intellect has walked the mind through that, the mind's not gonna lust after that anymore. That desire, that passion is going to be tempered with rationality. Now, a lot of people who want to go to the Olympics, who are striving, ask yourself, why do I want to go to the Olympics? Is it because um, deep down I'll be accepted, I'll be loved, I'll feel good about myself? What is the root? And hey, maybe we can like, use this reality check, check to go straight down to the root and say, you know what? I had a low self-esteem when I was younger. I got bullied in school. I got teased by all the kids. I was ugly. I had braces. I wore glasses, whatever. I'm deep down inside. I wanted to go to the Olympics to prove to everybody that I'm now great and they should like me. Go and explore. Look inward. Take this time and, and really don't just react to it. Respond consciously. No, I think and maybe, that's... You can, maybe you oh, can start on. to see that it's even in your best interest will prevent a lot of suffering down the road and help you to heal and grow a lot faster. 
That's good, Definitely. George. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we have anything else to add on that. I think that's a great way to put it. I know a lot of Olympic swimmers were posting their thoughts and feelings and being very reactionary to the decisions that the Olympics made. But like you said, I think uh, couldn't have put it any better myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you really want to go to the Olympics that bad? Why do you need it so much? Hmm. Ask yourself, is it to be loved, to be accepted, to get money? And if it's really about money, hey, <laughs> go. <laughs> You're on sport. There are better ways to make a living than swimming. Trust me. There are more healthier ways to make a, swimming than sw- a living than swimming. Certainly. All right, guys, anything else to wrap up here with George? No, thank you, George. Thank you, guys. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very glad. Yeah, we look to see. Look forward to having you back. I know um, you have a close relationship with Brian. You got to know John well, and look forward yeah. to you to know Justin. Yeah, you and Brian are close. World, I been for a while, and the whole world has gone crazy. Thing <laughs> <laughs> to do. It's very very strange, and um, I think that in these times. The real plague is the fear. And we have to remember that if we are afraid, the fear is like a sickness of the mind. And it has psychosomatic effects on the body of stressing the body. When the body gets stressed, the immune system goes down. So wash your hands, go to sleep early, take care of your body, stay healthy as possible. Um, Keep your immune system strong, you'll be fine. But don't succumb to the fear. Don't be one of those people like snatching toilet paper and running around screaming. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know gets afraid. Like, keep it in. Use your mind. Like Definitely. Yeah. All right. On that note, we wish everyone stay healthy, take care of yourself, especially during these stressful times. But thanks again to George for joining us. Really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone out there viewing us. If you have any other questions, you can post it here in the comments, and we'll do what we can to get back to you on them. But once again, take care of everyone. Be healthy, and we'll see you guys in the future. Okay. See you guys.